No, I want to thank the librarians there for uh, helping me. Uh, obviously, I'm not very technologically advanced. Uh, and uh, I'd also uh, one more time like to thank Roberta Peters Jones. I hope you're listening, Roberta. I don't know. Uh, but it's always a pleasure. And let's hope that next year uh, we could all be together again. I really miss the Coachella Valley. And uh, I'm going to be mentioning it in a couple contexts today, but all right, let's get started. I think we ended up with uh, Herbert Hoover and his very beautiful wife, Lou, who was multilingual and a graduate of Stanford. Then the next president and the man who served uh, was elected four times, Franklin D. Roosevelt. I have a little good trivia for you if you're a Mike Pence fan. Uh, Mike Pence could take a lot of solace with this. Uh, the only man ever to run for president, vice president, the only man ever to run for vice president on a losing ticket and later become president was Franklin D. Roosevelt. He ran for vice president in 1920 uh, on, on the Cox ticket, uh, lost to Harding and Coolidge, uh, and then later became president. So no other man who ever ran for vice president and lost ever became president except Franklin Roosevelt. So there, Mike Pence, if you're back in Indiana, maybe you can take some solace in that. Uh, and his very famous wife, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, who always went by Eleanor, her maiden name was Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she was a fifth cousin once removed to Franklin. Her uncle was none other than Theodore Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt had a brother, Elliot, who was a very heavy drinker. Uh, let's be blunt, he drank himself to death. Uh, and when Franklin and Eleanor married, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, President Teddy Roosevelt, gave him away. How about that wedding? Would you like a video of that? Uh, our coal region weddings, if they're videos, it's Dance Around Uncle Louie, who's drunk on the floor. Dance Around Uncle Louie. But would you like a video of the Roosevelts with President Teddy Roosevelt, the fifth cousin once removed to Franklin Roosevelt, giving away his niece, Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, to marry Franklin. So Eleanor Roosevelt became Eleanor Roosevelt. She didn't have to change her driver's license for you women that went through that pain, huh? All right, but anyway, Anna Eleanor Roosevelt, as uh, many historians put it, was the first first lady to really be given substantive assignments. Franklin Roosevelt, as you know, contracted polio in 1921. When he was 39 years old, he was confined to a wheelchair from then on. Uh, and uh, he hid it pretty well from the public that he really had no use of his legs uh, for the rest of his life. Uh, but he did, uh, he did say that Eleanor would be his legs uh, and she was his representatives. Uh, when he couldn't travel, she would do it. She really helped the Democrats a lot. I don't think there's any question now. Uh, she helped bring in, she was very open-minded toward black people when that wasn't a big deal. Uh, it was not a, a fashionable thing back in the 30s to be very uh, pro-civil rights, but Eleanor was. She was very open to gay people. Uh, she, as a woman, it was fairly assertive in a feminine sort of way. She did attract a lot of women to the Democratic Party, we now know. But I think her main thing, contribution really to the Democrats anyway, uh, was to bring in the Blacks. In 1928, a great majority of the Black people voted for Herbert Hoover like about 80% where they were allowed to vote. By 1936, about 80% of the Blacks voted for Franklin Roosevelt. It was the biggest turnaround of any group like that in, in American history. Within eight years, they went from 80% Republican, 80% Democrat, and more or less have remained there ever since. And Eleanor Roosevelt certainly deserves some credit for that. Uh, and our most active first lady remained uh, the grand dame of the Democratic Party right up and through the 1960s. She, I remember when I was rooting for Kennedy to get the nomination in 1960, uh, she was uh, at first opposed to Kennedy because she didn't like his father and didn't like the fact that Kennedy was less than vociferous in his opposition to Joe McCarthy, who uh, uh, really pilloried Franklin Roosevelt. But anyway, she, uh, she, she didn't back Kennedy when he got the nomination. She worked for the UN both under Kennedy and Truman. Uh, so she really was a, perhaps our most active first lady. She had a, a, a the only first lady who ever had a uh, daily newspaper column called My Day, which was syndicated in many newspapers back in the 30s and 40s. So Anna Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, did, uh, did Franklin take any amorous detours? And I'm gonna say yes, but Eleanor got even as you'll see in a moment. But uh, there have been much, there's been much made of Roosevelt's relationship with this woman, Lucy Mercer Rutherford. That's what she looked like around uh, 1919 when she began her little fling with Franklin Roosevelt. And that's what she looked like uh, in 1945 
uh, when when uh, Roosevelt died. And there's been a good bo many books, but one good one written about them, the best, I should say, FDR and Lucy by Rasa Willis. You can see that there. All right, but Lucy Mercer Rutherford was a, uh, in essence, Eleanor's secretary. Uh, she began flirting with Franklin, Eleanor's wife, uh, and they began a, a, an affair which really lasted uh, a much unknown in Eleanor until the very day that Roosevelt died in 1945 in Warren Spring, Georgia. Uh, Eleanor found out about the affair early on, uh, demanded that Franklin end it or else she would file for divorce, which would have ended his political career back in those days. Uh, one of the reasons Harding is, uh, who I talked about yesterday, stuck with his wife and she with him was to advance his political career. But certainly uh, uh, Franklin vowed that he would never go with Lucy again, but he never really broke off the affair. And during the war, when Roosevelt was very distraught and Eleanor was traveling around and Roosevelt was getting very depressed, the war wasn't always going well, da, 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 da. His own daughter, Anna, his first child, their first child, uh, contacted Lucy and, and got her back with Franklin. Could you imagine that? And when Eleanor found out about that, she, of course, devastated. But uh, Lucy was then seeing Roosevelt constantly during the war. Whenever Eleanor left the White House, which was frequently, she would come in. Uh, they actually wrote her name in visitors' logs at points. But whatever, it was a long-term affair. And she was with Roosevelt uh, in April of 1945. I believe it was April 12th, 1945, at Warm Springs, Georgia. Uh, Eleanor was up in New York. But she was down in Georgia with Franklin at the second White House in Warm Springs. And he was having a portrait painted that she was paying for. After she ended her fling with Ro Franklin, she married a very older man, very much older man, but a very wealthy man named Rutherford from New Jersey. And she was very wealthy uh, when she became widowed. And she was paying for a painting to be done of Franklin Roosevelt, which she fully intended to hang in her own house. And he said, Lucy, I have a terrible headache. She rushed over to him and he died in her arms. And when Eleanor came down to Warm Springs to pick up the body, uh, she was told by some of her confidants uh, that uh, what was going on. And only then did she find out that Franklin had rekindled this affair that had begun back around 1919. So that, that, that was kind of a hidden story. But did Eleanor uh, re retaliate? Yes, she did. We now know that Eleanor, who had five children, uh, was probably bisexual. She had many relationships with women, particularly this journalist, Lorena Hickok, who we now know stayed at the White House for many, many months uh, during uh, Roosevelt's presidency. In fact, Eleanor stayed in one wing of the White House and Franklin in the other. Uh, they publicly announced they never slept together, partly because of Roosevelt's condition with his legs. Uh, but Ellen, uh, Lorena's uh, room, so to speak, was always right next to Eleanor. So there was the Eleanor wing and the Franklin wing and Lorena Hickok, uh, a very prominent female journalist of the day, uh, had a room next to Eleanor. In fact, Franklin knew, kind of knew about it. Uh, he did know that Eleanor had very close female friends and he actually built a cabin uh, at Hyde Park, New York, his estate where Eleanor could entertain her girlfriends and he wouldn't have to be there. So it's very nice. He set up uh, Eleanor and her girlfriends in a, in a house. There, there you go. Good husband, huh? All right, Harry Truman. And again, one last time, Lucy Mercer was actually with Roosevelt when he died. The old saying, you died in your lover's arms. Uh, the, the next prominent politician who did that, remember? You, you think of the trivia? How about Nelson Rockefeller? Uh, died in bed with his mistress. There you go. How do you explain that to your wife? There. <laughs> All right. But anyway, Harry Truman and Beth uh, Elizabeth Virginia Wallace Truman, better known as Beth Truman, uh, they uh, married later in life. He was 35. She was 34 when they married. Uh, uh, Harry said he fell in love with Beth in, in uh, Independence, Missouri when they were in kindergarten. Or actually, he was in first grade and she was in kindergarten. Uh, and he said he only ever loved one woman in his whole life, and it was Beth. And that's that uh, seems to be true. Uh, uh, Truman certainly was never known to be a womanizer or anything like that. And they had a you know fairly good marriage. I think she was a little uppity. The Wallace family was a lot wealthier than the Trumans, but they seemed to have a good marriage until uh, in 1944, uh, while he was a senator, Franklin Roosevelt asked Truman to run for vice president. When Roosevelt ran for his fourth term in 1944 uh, against Tom Dewey, he asked uh, Harry Truman to become his vice president. He dropped a guy named 
uh, Henry Wallace and pick up Truman. Uh, she asked Truman not to do that. The first thing she ever asked for Truman politically, she did boss him around a little, but not politically. She helped him there. But she said, I don't want you to run for vice president because Roosevelt's sick. He's not going to last another four years. And in fact, he died in April of 45, uh, very early in his fourth term. Uh, and Truman said, why? And Bess made it very clear uh, Roosevelt's health was one thing, but the main thing was her father had committed suicide in 1903. And somehow she thought uh, somehow that would come out if she became uh, first lady. Never really did, but for some reason she thought that would be impactful. I mean, suicide did occur 30, 40 some years earlier. And also she had been put on a payroll. When the Trumans never had a lot of money. He's the only president in modern times that died not wealthy at all. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, when, 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 Bess, when he was a senator, he did something that a lot of senators did, uh, never do it now. He had his wife on the payroll for a job she really didn't do. Uh, and he paid her then 4,500 a year, which was pretty good money back in that time. And she was afraid that it would come out that she was a, a no-show worker if Harry became president. So she begged him not to become vice president. He refused, he did become vice president. And then of course her prophecy proved true. Uh, and Roosevelt died very early on in his uh, fourth term and Truman then served uh, the rest of Roosevelt's term and then one of his own when he won the miracle of 48. Uh, upsetting the same Tom Dewey I just referenced. So uh, their daughter, they only had one child, their daughter, Margaret, who was a, a singer and a, a great author. She wrote a lot of good mystery books, uh, but she wrote, uh, when they were both dead, she wrote a, several articles, including a book uh, that said that their relationship deteriorated markedly uh, after Truman ran for vice president. And Bess spent as much time away from the White House as she possibly could. It became very, very embarrassing to Harry that on many occasions they said, where's Bess? Oh, she's an independence. And she never really forgave him for that indiscretion in her mind. Uh, Eisenhower, and how about his wife, Mamie, uh, real name uh, Marie? Uh, they had a you know a, a really a, a decent relationship it seems uh, uh naturally they had some pressure because he he was a, a lower uh, he was a lieutenant when she married him and wound up a five-star general uh when he died uh but so they moved a lot and then when he became president uh, she was under that pressure uh mamie though didn't mind the limelight she uh, was famous for her bangs the Mamie Bangs, you women remember that one if you're old enough. Uh, she was a fairly attractive woman, no question about it. The only rap against her is she was, many people thought she was an alcoholic. Uh, that's still debatable. She slept late. Uh, you never made an appointment with Mamie before 10, 15. Uh, and, uh, she, but it now turned out that some posthumous medical records that were made available, she did have an inner ear problem. And I don't want to try to pronounce it, Meniere or some kind of disease, uh, but uh, I have trouble with my ears, so I, I should know. But anyway, uh, was she an alcoholic and she did stumble at times or did she lose her balance a little more often than she should have, to be honest, because of her inner ear problem. I think the jury is still out on that, uh, to be honest. Okay, did I take any amorous detours? Only one that we're really sure of. Uh, during the war, his chauffeur, a British whack, was uh, Kay Summersby, uh, who uh, she claims they had an affair. She wrote a book later on called Past Forgetting My Love Affair with Dwight D. Eisenhower. Uh, Kay Summersby was a British, uh, officer. Eisenhower had, when he was getting ready for D-Day, uh, Chief General George Marshall said to Eisenhower, give me a list of everything you absolutely need uh, as we prepare for D-Day. The first thing he put on was not 5 million men or 10,000 planes or G George Patton as an assistant. He put down, I want Kay Summers be as my chauffeur. That, I mean, come on. And that uh, that made pa uh, that made uh, George Marshall very suspicious and his relationship with Eisenhower kind of deteriorated because Marshall did not approve of any hanky-panky. He felt you had to serve your country and, uh, and put everything aside uh, in service to your country. And the man that was really Eisenhower's mentor, he and Ike were never really as close after that uh, as, as they were as, as Marshall made Eisenhower really a five-star general. Uh, Marshall was always Eisenhower's boss, but they were not as friendly after. Kay Summersby, uh, 
wrote that book. She did try to get back. Uh, Eisenhower denied the affair. She uh, she tried to recon uh, at least meet Eisenhower again while he was president of Columbia University in the late 40s. He refused to meet her. So she then later on wrote a book called Past Forgetting. Uh, if you read the book, it's a fascinating book, not only because of their relationship, but the book gets into a lot of good trivia on some of the people involved in World War II, like de Gaulle and Churchill, some of their idiosyncrasies, uh, Patton, uh, 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 George C. Marshall, a lot of stuff. For example, Marshall, the reason American generals are not called field marshals like they are in Europe is because George Marshall, our first five-star general, would not be called field marshal Marshall. He said, I'll refuse the promotion. And if he didn't get promoted, then uh, the next in line was MacArthur and Eisenhower. So they got upset and said, George, you got to do something. He said, all right, then give me another title. And they called him general of the army. Uh, so we don't have field marshals, thanks to no field marshal marshal. All right, Jack Kennedy, my hero. I used to say the first Catholic president, the only, and I'll be the second one. That can't be said anymore. We now have our second Catholic president for two days now. Uh, and uh, we know, now know that he had a very beautiful wife, Jacqueline Bouvier Kennedy. You could see that everybody in my high school class, I guess, was in love with her. I was always a little leery of really thin women somehow. I always felt you're going to hurt them uh, if you touched them or something. And she was a little too thin for me, so to speak. Uh, but uh, she captivated the country. She was the most stylish first lady. Uh, since Dolly Madison, she set trends. Uh, look at that hat, the pillbox hat, the dresses. I don't know what they were called. Uh, everything was Jackie, Jackie, Jackie. Uh, she helped renovate the White House, uh, which Dolly Madison also did. The only one that could really compare to her as far as impact on, on style and culture uh, was uh, was Dolly Madison. Uh, she got Kennedy interested in opera and stage plays, and she had violinists, Pablo Casals and others in the White House. And one of the reasons the Kennedy Center for the Entertaining Arts is called the Kennedy Center is partly because of her. She really instilled uh, the cultural aspects into Kennedy. He was very much a locker room type guy uh, until he met Jackie, and she did make him a much more cultured uh, uh, person. Uh, so anyway, we do know that he took his share of Amherst detours. How about happy birthday, Mr. President? Uh, she sang that song to him at his birthday party, I believe in 1962 uh, at Madison Square Garden. Uh, it was a stag birthday party, Marilyn being the uh, main attraction. If that didn't make Jackie suspicious, I don't know what did. Uh, but anyway, that dress you can see was so tight. Uh, she actually had to be sewn into it. Uh, she had her seamstress come in. Uh, she stripped naked and had that dress sewed on around her. It's the only way she could get into it. And then she flew coast to coast uh, in non-jets in those days. She flew coast to coast from Los Angeles to New York with uh, Kennedy's brother-in-law, Peter Lawford. And then she uh, sang that song, uh, Happy Birthday, Mr. President. She later on had a little relationship with Bobby Kennedy too. Uh, I, I was always fascinated by Marilyn Monroe because of my uh, interest in Joe DiMaggio, who was, uh, she was married to at one point. In fact, he, he continued to put flowers, Joe DiMaggio did. He uh, continued to put flowers on her grave right up until the time he died. I think I did mention that. Uh, Kennedy had many, many, many flings. I'm only gonna mention one more because uh, he met her a lot of times out in Palm Springs, Angie Dickinson. And Kennedy was once asked about her by one of his friends. He said, no, she's not a mistress. She's a, my advisor on affairs. So uh, Angie said, yeah, I'm a, a domestic affairs advisor uh, to the president. And she later on uh, admitted uh, to a long-term liaison with Kennedy and he would meet her in Palm Springs and then drive to uh, drive to Palm Desert and attend mass at Sacred Heart, I guess to ask forgiveness. But there you go. All right, and we move on to Jackie Look. I even hesitated to put this picture up. That was the last picture taken of Kennedy and her in some ways. Uh, that was right in Dallas where she was in that pink suit and given those roses. They then got in the motorcade and unfortunately, you know what happened later. But that, that was a very iconic picture of a very beautiful woman. One of the reasons she was attracted to Kennedy, who was a notorious womanizer, he was in his, well in his 30s when he married her uh, in 1953. Uh, I think she was 23, he was 37, or I don't know, something like, she was 12 years older than her. But, uh, but she 
almost idolized him because her father, Jack Bouvier, who had divorced her mother, but she was very infatuated with her father, Black Jack Bouvier. And I think she saw in Kennedy, her father, who she loved until the day he died. Okay, Lyndon Johnson. And how about Claudia? Lady Bird Johnson, one of our nicest first ladies. Uh, she did a lot for highway beautification. Uh, she uh, cleaned up junkyards that were located within certain distances of highways. She made Johnson spend more money on the arts and stuff like that than he wanted to. And she was a very lovely mother, very wonderful first lady. I don't think there's any question about that. They seem to have a good relationship. Uh, she openly allowed Johnson to have a few flings, uh, and, and he had, some, you know, he was almost as bad as Kennedy in some ways, uh, but uh, or good, whichever way I guess you want to look at it. But Johnson once said, "I slept with more women by accident than Kennedy did on purpose." And when he said that, Lady Bird was serving him and his friends drinks, and she didn't even blink an eye. So she uh, was, you know, a very understanding woman, I guess, and she loved her children. Had two lovely daughters, as you remember. Member, and everybody liked Lady Bird. When the war started in Vietnam and Johnson became somewhat unpopular, her popularity remained sky high. It would be very difficult to find a nicer woman, at least seemingly, uh, than Lady Bird. I never read anything bad about her uh, in any way. And like Alice Roosevelt, I look for bad things to read about people. Well, one of Johnson's affairs that, well, while he was a senator that really intrigues me, he had a spleen with and she admitted this, and he did later on. Helen Gahagan Douglas, remember her? Melvin Douglas's wife. Helen Gahagan Douglas was a very prominent Democrat in California for a while, a congressman. Very beautiful actress, as you can see there. I think she's very attractive, uh, Helen Gahagan Douglas. And in 1952, uh, after her little fling with Lyndon or while it was going on, she had a uh, she ran for the United States Senate in California when it was more a Republican state back in the 50s. And she ran against a guy named Richard Nixon. You ever hear him? And uh, it was during the McCarthy Red Scare, the height of the McCarthy Red Scare. And uh, Nixon uh, pilloried her as the pink lady. Why the pink lady? He said, uh, Mrs. Douglas is not a communist. She's not red, but she's close. She's pink. And she became the pink lady. And I remember when my plane first landed in Palm Springs, when I uh, interviewed its college in the desert, I drove in, I guess, on, what is that route? Is that, what is that? I forget. 101, what was that? Uh, route one is here in Delta, route 101, I don't know. But when I drove in, there was a, night, a nightclub, which was really, I didn't know it was a, it was a topless dancing hall. I didn't know at the time, but it was called the Pink Lady. And I thought it was some kind of a memorial uh, to Helen Hagen Douglas, little did I know. Uh, but Lyndon Johnson uh, had an affair with her amongst other people. Okay, Richard Nixon, as we're going to get to the pink lady guy. Thelma Ryan. Uh, I saw her live back in 1960. And I, I, the only word I could ever say for her is ethereal. She looked, I mean, she was almost as delicate as porcelain. She, I, I was thinking in 1960, I saw Kennedy campaign and him. And I... Uh, I thought, geez, Jackie's certainly attractive, but what's wrong Nixon's wife? She was really almost like a porcelain doll, just perfect. Uh, again, for my taste, maybe a little too thin, but a uh, very attractive woman. She spoke briefly at, uh, when I, he was in town, and uh, she was a very, very wonderful woman, it seemed. She put up with a lot with him. We know he had his mental hang-ups, a uh, very brilliant man, but he had his, uh, his phobias, no question about it, and he drank a little too much. And she, uh, she was very, one, was kind of his consoling force. And I don't think he ever would have become president uh, as, as even vice president if it weren't for Pat Nixon. And the reason she was called Pat, her real name was Selma. Uh, she was born on March 16th. Uh, her family was not Catholic, but Ryan was obviously of Irish. Uh, she was Selma Pat Ryan. Uh, then she became Nixon, of course. But uh, one of the reasons they called her Pat was she was born just on, very late on an, in the evening of March 16th. So they put in her birth certificate March 17th, St. Patrick's Day. And I bet you nobody knew that little trivia. That's why she became Pat Nixon, Richard Nixon. And he did depend on her, not so much for public uh, advice on politics and all, but privately, he needed a stabilizing force. He really did. Uh, his fears, his hatreds of people had to be tempered. We now know that for sure. Uh, and she was right there. And she probably did the country a great service. J. 
Gerald Ford, uh, the hero of the Coachella Valley. All right. Uh, fascinating guy, one of the most popular men in the history of the Coachella Valley, and his more popular wife. If there were ever really a first lady that transcended the popularity of her husband, and Gerald Ford was popular, but he went up and down. Uh, everybody loved Elizabeth Bloomer Ford. You can see a very attractive woman. I'm fascinated by her. I uh, I ran into her a couple times. Somehow she didn't know me uh, at a couple of stores uh, when she when I was living out there, and so was she. Very popular, the Coachella Valley's first couple in many ways. Uh, uh, Betty Ford was a, a very outspoken woman. Uh, she, uh, while Gerald Ford was the Republican president, she openly favored the Equal Rights Amendment, which officially the Republican Party did not do at that time, and it was never adopted. And she also was pro-choice, not pro, uh, pro-life, pro pro-choice, uh, unabashedly uh, pro-choice. And she made that very clear to Gerald and to the Republican Party. Uh, she spoke her mind, uh, no question about that. She was our second divorced first lady. She was married to a man briefly from 1942 to 47 by the name of William Warren, I believe, uh, uh, furniture salesman, if I'm not wrong, William Warren. And then uh, when they divorced, uh, she was set up on a blind date with this very famous football player turned congressman, Gerald Ford. Uh, and if you didn't know, Gerald Ford's real name was Leslie Lynch King. He was born Leslie Lynch King, uh, but his father abandoned him and his mother. His mother remarried a guy named Ford, and he uh, was adopted and changed his, they changed his name to Gerald Ford. But Gerald Ford was really Leslie Lynch King. And what a guy. They made fun of him because he was kind of stumbled around. Uh -uh. He was the best athlete we ever had as president. Now I'm totally jealous. Why could I never look like that? Uh, was Gerald Ford a good looking guy? Remember Joe Palooka in the comic strips and Little Abner? If they ever made a movie, just wouldn't he have been the perfect Little Abner? Yeah, look at it. There, there he is in World War II. But my gosh, can't see, he's a god. It's amazing. Uh, it's not nice to be jealous and hateful, Bill, but I'm jealous and hateful. Okay, but anyway. Here's Gerald Ford. I mean, come on, Bill, again. Why am I getting excited about men here? Okay, come on, come on, up, picture. There's, okay. He was the male model, and he was the male model for that cosmopolitan cover. That woman he dated for a while or whatever, and Betty never liked to see that picture. Uh, that woman actually existed. There was a female model, and he was the male who modeled for that painting. Uh, in Cosmopolitan. There he is when he was all Big Ten in football. They say, they made fun that he was clumsy. Clumsy. He was the an all Big Ten football player. Uh, he then went to Yale Law School after he graduated Michigan. He, he was all state in high school, went to Michigan, all Big Ten, uh, then uh, went to Yale Law School. Partly they accepted him at Yale Law School. He, he had good grades, but they accepted him there partly because he agreed to be an assistant coach on a football team. That's how good he was. Uh, and um, my gosh, he was a great skier later in life. Uh, he was a decent golfer. Uh, I don't think there's any question. And any, any question that he was the best athlete who ever became president. I don't think there's any argument about it. And uh, I would say that he was the best looking man ever to become president. How about that? I put him ahead of Kennedy as a young man. Kennedy died so much younger than Ford. that It's not a fair comparison. But compare him at this point to Kennedy when he was in his early 20s or Franklin Pierce, who playboy ran a a stupid thing in the 1960s, ranking their best looking presidents, uh, that very intellectual uh, uh, magazine Playboy that all of us men read only for the articles. That was one time I did read it for the articles. So they did uh, rank the presidents according to looks. Unfortunately, he wasn't president yet, but they, then they had, uh, uh, first was Kennedy, second was Franklin Pierce. And I think I think Franklin Roosevelt was third. But anyway, Ford, in my opinion, would be. So he was a male model, great football player. And here's Betty. She was a professional dancer. She uh, studied at the Bennington School of Dance in Vermont. Don't get any better than that. She stud studied, and maybe you won't know this name, but you should, one of the greatest dancers in all of American history, one of the great dance instructors, Martha Graham. She studied under Martha Graham. Could you beat, beat that one? Uh, and uh, she, right when he lost the election in 1976 to Carter, uh, the last day he was in office, June, January 19th, 1977, she got up on the, uh, on the uh, 
cabinet meeting desk and danced on the cabinet meeting desk, much to the delight of the press corps. And there are some pictures of that I understand were shown at the library when they were honoring her a few months ago. But Betty Ford, a very attractive, agile woman, professional dancer, retained her dancing skills right until the end. She was no spring chicken, as you can see there, and she was still dancing with professionals and more than holding her own. Uh, and here's the Ford wedding. Talk about, and I'll say it one more time, talk about a good looking couple, huh? huh take, take that. That's better than Jackie and Jack, I think so. Look at that, man. Oh man. Okay, I'm gonna get so mad here and jealous. Uh, but there's Betty, you could see, extremely attractive woman and remained so right until the end of her life. Oh, and then she did, of course, do so many good things. She, uh, she worked so hard for charities, Betty Ford. Uh, let me just, of course, the Betty Ford Center in Rancho Mirage. Come on, how many people has that helped? Uh, and she is just immortalized. And I think she was so brave, admitting she had an alcohol and drug problem, admitting it, that's so hard. And then also admitting she was going to have a mastectomy. She faced breast cancer head on, a beautiful woman like that. Many women that were of that beauty uh, would resist a, a, an operation like that and cancer would spread and they would die. So she felt it was her duty to be open about the breast removal. And, you know, I just, everybody loved Betty Ford. Uh, and I did too. But I keep saying Jerry's so good looking. Maybe I can love him too. You never know. Okay, Jimmy Carter. How about Rosalind? Uh, I bet you don't know her real first name, Rosalind Smith. Rosalind was her mid middle name. Eleanor, Eleanor Rosalind Smith Carter. Uh, she worked very hard on a, a part of a mental uh, problems special. She wanted to fight mental retardation and birth defects that led to mental disabilities. Uh, she was the second first lady to testify before Congress. Uh, the only one that testified, only first lady up to that point that had testified before Congress. Remember Hillary doing it over the healthcare thing later on, but Rosalind Carter testified before Congress on health issues. Uh, she be under the table, tried to prompt Carter to readopt the idea of universal health care. Truman had proposed that in 1949. It had not obviously passed. We still don't have it. And Jimmy Carter uh, kind of favored it, but was afraid to bring it out for fear of political backlash. And there would have been a tremendous backlash I, I believe in the 70s had you pr uh, proposed universal health care, old Truman did it unsuccessfully in the late 1940s. But Rosalind acted quietly. She was never flamboyant, very attractive woman, I think, very, very stylish. And uh, he depended on her. He told her everything. Uh, he was very devout, born again Christian. And uh, he believed in your wife being your equal. And he told her everything politically. He didn't never condescended. She wouldn't have permitted it. I think she would have walked out on him had he been condescending. Uh, they had, a, you know, Amy, their famous daughter, who uh, is still banging around. She got a master's degree, is working away, married. Uh, but uh, uh, Rosalind and Jimmy are still alive. She is 97 now, I believe 97. And she is the oldest. No other first lady lived to be 97 years old. Uh, so she is the first lady that has lived the longest, and with a little luck, the both of them will pass 100. Uh, and I, Amy ought to live there for to be about 200 with her genes. Huh? But she actually sat in on cabinet meetings. Uh, she advised Jimmy Carter on affairs in the Middle East. Uh, and she was a lot more powerful woman than people let on, but her genteel Southern upbringing uh, allowed, uh, told, dictated to her that she not be overtly pushy about it, but she was a very well-informed, very respected woman. Had a bunch of good first ladies in these days, huh? And there's Ronnie. And there is Nancy, uh, another beautiful woman, of course, an actress, uh, and uh, Ronald Reagan. That was his second wife, Nancy Davis Reagan. They did make one movie together, Sailors Ahoy, or what was it, 1957? They did make uh, one movie together, and she made one appearance with him on the General Electric Theater on Sunday night. Remember Sunday night at 9 o'clock? Right after Ed Sullivan or the Comedy Hour, you watched you watched the General Electric Theater with uh, Chuck Wagon Ronald. Huh? He was the old ranger or whatever, he, for Braxo Soap, I think. But anyway, they uh, he was an actor, president of Screen Actors Guild. Uh, he Nancy Reagan was a 
a very, not an overwhelmingly great A actress, but a good actress, uh, made a lot of good shows on, and not only on, in, in, on the big screen, but did then transitioned into television, not on a big time basis, but she was certainly one of the female stars that was able to transition somewhat uh, to the small screen. Many of the big time actresses could not do that. Certainly a, a solid actress and a, 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 a very uh, powerful woman. Uh, who uh, stood for many causes, and uh, her good looks certainly never left her, and uh, she was well aware of that. And of course, he was married once before. Did you know that? Jane Wyman. Jane Wyman was his first wife. They had one child, Maureen. Uh, this was Mrs. Reagan number one. Uh, the only thing Nancy resented about her is this lady, Jane Wyman, was clearly a better actress than almost anybody not necessarily Nancy Davis. Uh, she won an Oscar for Johnny Belinda. What year? 1948. She played a deaf mute uh, in that movie, Johnny Belinda. And to, uh, to prepare for that, she went to a deaf mute school as a teaching observer for six months. And she made, she made film the whole movie, the whole movie with wax in her ears so she could not hear. Uh, and for that, she won an Oscar. She was nominated for either best actress or supporting actress four times. Uh, she transitioned into TV. She had her own television show in the 1950s uh, and uh, uh, was also, I don't know if you remember this, had a very long run on one of the original primetime soap operas. Remember what it was? I bet you don't. How about Falcon Crest? She played the villainess uh, in Falcon Crest, which in, introduced us to a guy named Fernando, was it Lamas? who all the women fell in love with at that time. Uh, but there, uh, uh, and she died uh, in Rancho Mirage. Uh, it's interesting, died not far from the library in Rancho Mirage in her sleep, and she's buried in Cathedral City. So how about that? She became very good friends with Loretta Young in her later years, and that's one of the reasons she was in the Rancho Mirage area. She became very religious in her later years, converted to Catholicism, uh, and was very, very honored by the Catholic Church uh, when she died. In fact, she was allowed to be buried in a semi-habit, a nun's semi-habit, uh, because of her contributions to various Catholic sodalities and some of her generous donations. So she became a very again, born again Catholic, so to speak, toward the end of her life. And uh, Loretta Young, as I remember, was very devout Catholic, and that's why they become so, became such good friends. George Bush, who I met personally, at the Vintage Country Club. How about that? Uh, one of my friends uh, uh, had, uh, was a dear friend of George Bush, and he had me in, uh, uh, gave me a half an hour free time just with him, private time. And I, he was a fascinating man. We talked for a half hour. Seemed like five minutes to me. I'll never forget it. And I was forever indebted to President Bush, the only time I ever met a president. Uh, and he was just a wonderful, wonderful man, uh, very Funny, we talked baseball for the whole time. He was, of course, uh, the youngest fighter pilot, Navy fighter pilot in World War II. Uh, very, very much honored uh, for his service. Uh, graduated Yale, uh, was a, a first baseman at Yale. He, he was one of the last baseball players to talk to Babe Ruth, who was at a Yale game. Uh, he was captain of the team, and a couple of days after that game, Ruth died. So one of the last baseball players he saw was George Bush. A lot of stuff about him. Uh, and a, a, a fairly popular president. Unfortunately, the economy got a little uh, rugged toward the end of his term. But he was uh, eight years of vice president, four years of president, rivaling Richard Nixon on that one. Uh, so uh, not many people would say that. Thomas Jefferson, uh, George Bush. Uh, but anyway, he was elected uh, in his own right, 1988. Remember who he beat of it? You know, Michael Dukakis, remember? And uh, his very lovely wife, who briefly said hello to me when I met him, Barbara Pierce Bush, one of the nicest women, I think you'd have to admit. Uh, very popular in the Coachella Valley, too. They spend a lot of time out here uh, at the Vintage and other places. Uh, but Barbara Pierce Bush, a woman from a very wealthy family in her own right, a uh, very lovely mother, obviously. Her kids and grandchildren are just devoted to her. I remember when her two granddaughters got a little rambunctious. Uh, they didn't talk to daddy and mommy. They talked to Granny Barbara, and she set them straight very quickly. Uh, I don't forget that. I think she told them who controlled the money here, girls. But anyway, she was a, was a very, very lovely person, uh, very open, very home 
Pops Fund for a, a woman of her accomplishments, no question about it. Everybody loved Barbara Bush. I'd hate to put her in a popularity contest with Betty Ford, but uh, we'd see. Okay, and uh, talk about good looking. I hate, to, am I getting too much on it? Look at this. Maybe with that picture, you'd say, why did he marry her? With this picture, and I said it to him when we were teasing each other, I said, why did she ever marry you? <laughs> and he laughed. He said, I think she had an eye problem. Uh, but uh, my gosh, isn't that beautiful? Very, very extra uh, attractive, intelligent woman. Uh, very fitting that she became first lady, Barbara Bush. Okay, there's Bill Clinton. And I think you know her, Hillary Rodham Clinton, uh, the first first lady to have a graduate degree. She uh, went to Wellesley and then got a Yale Law degree where she met him at Yale Law School. So she was the, many of the succeeding first ladies have had advanced degrees, but uh, she was the first first lady to have anything beyond a bachelor's degree. As And you know, she was a Senator and a very outspoken woman, ran for president I believe she did one in 2016. Yeah, I think that was Hillary Rodham Clinton. Uh, when she was first lady of Arkansas, she insisted on being called Hillary Rodham. And when he ran for re-election, he was defeated, partly because she was not exactly a Bubba type girl for Arkansas. Huh? So she then changed her name to Hillary Rodham Clinton. And then when he ran for re-election, uh, in those days, Arkansas had two year terms for governor. So he won, he lost. And when she changed her name, he won again and then was on his way to becoming president. But probably no first lady was ever accomplished, is as accomplished in her own right. I think we have to admit that. Then Hillary Rodham Clinton came within an eyelash for being president, twice elected to United States Senate, Secretary of State, and just a humble person, right? There you go. And of course, we know Bill took an amorous detour too. And Monica was, if Angie Dickinson was Kennedy's foreign affairs advisor, Monica was his office assistant. And she was uh, an intern. Uh, and incidentally, I don't cry for Monica. She is now a very wealthy woman. She made a lot of money, amongst other things, selling purses, if you will. And it was partly because of her little dalliance with. Uh, Bill Clinton. George Bush, of course, uh, his father was president, and a very lovely Laura Welsh Bush, uh, who uh, had a master's degree in library science, uh, did a lot to promote literacy while she was first lady. Uh, she favored uh, some positions on ERA and abortion, et cetera, that the uh, Republican Party didn't necessarily like, but she was a good, solid Republican, did a lot to help bring women into the Republican Party. Can, uh, uh, really not only pestered him, but a lot of leading Republicans, including Ronald Reagan, who at times would go the other way when he saw her because he, she wanted uh, more women to run for office under the Republican banner. I think she'd be very happy what happened in this last election cycle. Uh, but uh, Laura Welch Bush uh, could, uh, was uh, uh, a librarian and uh, had a master's degree. So you had some pretty well-educated women here. I'm getting there, I'm getting close to the end. Barack, of course, and Michelle, the first black president, first woman of color to be first lady. And she, how about this? She went to Princeton undergrad and Yale Law. Is that, that's not too shabby, is it? Princeton undergrad and Yale Law, how about that? He went to what, Occidental and any uh, transfer, where did he transfer to? A, I forget now, it's a mental block here. But he went to Yale Law where they met. And I think she was actually higher in the rankings than him. Uh, she would have been a very accomplished player. I don't know if you know her brother was a very good uh, basketball player, uh, coached uh, Oregon State basketball a few years ago. I think he's still an assistant coach somewhere. But she came from a very successful family, not money-wise, but the, the kids all made good either academically or uh, uh, athletically. So you had Barack and Michelle, and there's some rumor that if a uh, Supreme Court uh, position comes open under uh, Biden, that it may be Barack Obama. I put her on. Uh, she's a little younger and probably just as bright in the law, uh, certainly by judging by her accomplishments at Yale Law. All right. And then we have uh, Donald, and I guess you'd have to say our most beautiful first lady, right? I'd have to give her the edge. Uh, uh, Donald and Melania, uh, other than uh, John Quincy Adams' wife, Louisa, 
She is the only woman, only first lady born overseas. And she's the only first lady that was born a non-American citizen, uh, other than Martha and all of Washington were born under the British flag. But she was born in Slovenia as a Slovenian. Uh, so she's a, a naturalized citizen. Louisa Johnson, remember, had an American father. So she was uh, a native or natural born American. She didn't have to be naturalized. A professional model, as you know, and all that kind of stuff. And uh, very outspoken in, in some areas. Uh, but I think she was a nice, quiet first lady. Some people thought she should have been more assertive. I don't know. It's up to you. Uh, but he is 24 years older than her. And the biggest age difference is, I think I mentioned uh, uh, John Tyler was 30 years older than his second wife. And uh, Grover Cleveland was 28 years older than his wife, uh, Frances Cleveland. But Donald was is 24 years older than Melania. And they have one child, of course. And there's Donald and Mel number two. How about that? All right. Now, Donald was also a divorced president. Here, he's married three times. There, you remember her, Ivana. I saw her in Atlantic City, and she was that attractive, that made up, that always dressed to the T. Uh, that is Ivana, uh, who Ivanka, his favorite daughter, is the product of that marriage. And then he married an actress or more of a TV star named Marla Maples. And that's Tiffany, who you don't hear much about. But let me tell you about her. Uh, Tiffany went to the University of Pennsylvania, as Donald did undergrad, uh, then uh, got a law degree, a law degree from Georgetown. That ain't too shabby either, my friends. And she just the other day, when he was leaving the White House, announced that she is marrying into a billionaire's family. She's marrying a man of five years younger than her, uh, but he's the son of a, a very, he's accomplished in his own right, but he's a, a married, he, he's a scion of a billionaire family. So uh, she is going to do very, very well. I'm sure she already has. Uh, Penn and Georgetown are not bad pedigrees, my friends. And then the last ones, Joe and Jill. Well, come on, Bill, come on. We have Joe and Jill went up the hill, and there you go. Uh, Jill, uh, Joe is our second Catholic president. You probably heard enough about him in the last two days that you don't want me saying too much more. Uh, Jill, a very attractive woman. She's going to be 70 very shortly. Uh, she is very well educated, probably the most educated first lady. She likes to be called Dr. Jill. I don't blame her. I'm in a similar boat. Uh, we have you know uh, academic degrees, not law degrees, but she, get this, uh, she uh, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Delaware. She has a master's degree from my undergraduate alma mater, Westchester State of Pennsylvania. And you know how brilliant you have to be to go to Westchester. So we have that in common. She then got another master's degree, an MA, from Villanova University Catholic School in Philadelphia, noted for its basketball. And then she just finished, not many years ago, an EDD, Doctor of Education, which certainly gives her the right to be called doctor, at least in the professional settings, uh, a Doctor of Education uh, from Delaware, University of Delaware. Uh, she taught at a community college here called Delaware Tech for a few years. But before that, and I would never have the guts to do this, she's just a little younger than me, but when she did this, I would have been the same age roughly. I could never have done it. Uh, she went into a high school in some tough areas, taught high school for the better part of 12 years. Uh, you get combat pay in some high schools now, I'm sorry to say. Uh, but uh, she's a very, very assertive woman. I don't think there's any question. And again, a, a bachelor's degree, two masters, and a doctorate. And I don't think people should make fun of her when she wants to be called doctor. I, if I ever meet her, I will certainly call her that. All right. So there you have it. Uh, and he's, I think I mentioned our second Catholic president, so I can only be the third Catholic president now. Joe, you messed me up. All right. And then there's a picture I stumbled in while I was getting ready for this. How about that? I don't think four, five nice women. Look, Hillary, don't tell me she's not attractive in her own way. And obviously those other four, Nancy Reagan was senior citizen at that time, but still look at her. And Jackie in her prime there. Look who's behind Jackie glaring at her. I left this picture up. Her. Guess who that? That's Lyndon Johnson. Look, tell me Lyndon wasn't a dirty old man. At least he was consistent. He was a dirty young man, dirty middle-aged man. He died a dirty old man. That's can, Pete Rose always said, if you're consistent, you're great. So Lyndon was consistent. And then there's Hillary in the middle, Michelle, 
and then of course Melania, who also was quite a trendsetter. So was uh, Michelle, really. Uh, Melania, of course, has the perfect form, obviously, to wear anything she wants. So there you go, all right? And if you want to do any further reading on First Ladies, these are the books I recommend, there are many others, some on the individual First Ladies, uh, but uh, they're the ones I would recommend. Uh, the Susan Swain book is probably the newest. Uh, Lewis Gould is a very well-known historian. Uh, he's dead now, but he he wrote many uh, deeply uh, academic books, uh, especially was the Gilded Age in the early 20th century. But uh, and they're all big name historians there. Uh, so if you ever want to do any further reading on the uh, First Ladies and their relationships with the husbands, uh, you can certainly start there. And uh, TJ, I think I'm done. So maybe we could start some questions. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Sorry for any technical glitches, but we got this right. Once it got rolling, everything was fine. And again, thank you to the people of the Coachella Valley. I miss you dearly. My wife misses you more because uh, she's a sonaholic. So we, uh, we'd love to be out there next year. God speed that we can. Uh, our only problem is going to be how we get our dog out there because we can't claim her as its uh, emotional support dog for me anymore. I'm certifiably crazy, but they won't accept them anymore. But we'll drive out if we have to, because I had 22 or three great years out there and uh, at both COD and uh, Cal State. And many of my years at Cal State were spent at the center there. So just great memories. And uh, uh, when they put me in a grave, that's certainly going to be one of my last thoughts is going to be in a very beautiful Coachella Valley. And I'm happy here in Delaware, was happy in Pennsylvania. So I guess, anyway, I could say I am lived in three pretty darn good places I could and loved every one of them. But I'll, I'm sorry for rambling. Go ahead, uh, TJ. Well, uh, OK, that's a good segue to a, a kind of related question that we had come in. Um, someone was curious, did most of the presidents have a dog? Yes, almost all presidents had a dog. We're dog lovers. Uh, Trump was the first president, many, many presidents not to have an animal of any kind. Teddy Roosevelt had dogs and horses and an alligator. Uh, yes, almost all. Pre Franklin Roosevelt had the very, very famous phala that the Republicans attacked viciously in one, in one campaign. That's unbelievable. Phala was a little uh, uh, Scotty that seemed to know Franklin was being buried. When he was buried, the dog cried at his, his, as his uh, coffin was lowered into the ground. Yes. And of, of course, uh, President Biden is the first one to have a rescue dog, and he has two dogs because his rescue dog is now about 13 years old. Uh, so they wanted to have a second dog, and I know what it is to lose a dog. We cried more and we lost dogs, and I think any time it really is. Yes, so almost all presidents had pet dogs. The most famous was Fala, uh, the pet dog of uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt. You might remember uh, Clinton had the cat, what was it, Socks? And everybody named their cat Socks. Remember Socks? Uh, Clinton had, uh, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, most presidents had dogs, yes. All right, uh, we have another question from Donald. Uh, he asks, is it true that under FDR's New Deal, Eleanor started and supported the Pack Horse Library Project? She supported library projects under the WPA. So it's possible. Uh, under the WPA, they built libraries in high schools and grade schools, and she did push him to include libraries in there. So that could have been, yes. I mean, I, I don't know if that one specifically, but in general, uh, uh, she liked libraries partly because they service not only young people, as schools did, but older people. She was one of, and I'll tell you, some like your library there and our library here, uh, a lot of old people take advantage uh, especially on computers. Most people my age bracket, we weren't raised with computers. So some people my age group don't even have one. They go to the library. I'm sure it's true out there. So yes, yes, she was a library, pro-library. I cannot speak specifically to that library. All right. Um, also a question on uh, FDR. What was FDR's relationship with the crown princess Martha of Norway? Okay. Uh, crown princess Martha? Of Norway. Yes, I had her picture up in these outlines and I deleted it because I was strapped for time. 
before Crown Prince, and I don't have her picture here, she was a very beautiful princess from Norway. Norway was conquered by the Nazis. She escaped and lived in the White House for several years during World War II. Before she died, she claimed Franklin Roosevelt uh, actually, not forced, but told her that he wanted to have sex with her. And if she didn't, her welcome at the White House might not be continued. So yes, there was more than a rumor, which seems to have a lot of merit to it by some stuff that's been discovered in the last 10 years, five years really, that he did have a fling with Princess, uh, the Princess of Norway, yes. Very, very uh, beautiful woman, much younger than him. Uh, we had another question come in, and I think this was, somebody was curious about this the other day and today as well. Did Martha Washington free her slaves when she died? No, uh, not all of them, only some, because by the time she died uh, as a woman, she didn't uh, have a complete control over her estate. Uh, some had passed to her children. Uh, so, uh, no, she didn't free them all. Washington freed all of his slaves, but couldn't free hers, remember, because she had inherited them from that Custis, uh, her first husband. So she did not free all of them, no. Okay. Uh, Michelle has a question. Did all first ladies have a, quote, pet project federal initiative, such as it takes no, a village no. it's, and no it's child left behind? I, 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 I alluded to this briefly. Uh, a lot of the earlier first ladies, unfortunately, were not allowed to have stuff like that. They were supposed to be seen and not heard. The rules of the day dictated women uh, take a very subservient position. Remember the rights of coverture. Once you married, everything you had turned over to your husband. In most states back until really the 1900, around 1900, if you were married, you couldn't even have a bank account in your own name. So uh, any first lady back in the 19th century or Washington's time that came forward as aggressively as say Eleanor Roosevelt or Betty Ford or you know even uh, uh, Hillary Clinton certainly they would have been they would have been the ruin of their husbands their husbands would have been called henpecked and that would have been the end of their political careers it was unfortunate that's what I say women have never in my opinion achieved equality but at least they're approximating it now back then it was tragic. And no, the first ladies, the most influence they could exert was on their husbands privately. Some did, some didn't. Of those uh, more recent first ladies that were able to have some of those programs, are there some that you think were the most impactful? Well, Eleanor Roosevelt had the most impact politically. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, Betty Ford, with. Uh, probably with the alcohol stuff and the medical stuff with uh, ma not only mastectomies, but making medic medical uh, care available to more people, though she didn't favor single payer. Uh, I think Betty Ford probably of all the modern first ladies, except for Eleanor Roosevelt had the most impact. Jackie Kennedy, Kennedy had the most impact culturally. Uh, she didn't get into a lot of uh, crusading politically. She was more interested in culture and stuff like that, uh, redecorating the White House. So I would say culturally her and politically Eleanor Roosevelt, and I would say socially and uh, in, in a more socioeconomic way related to medicine, especially Betty Ford. Okay. Uh, and Michelle I Obama too, yes. Uh, uh, she, yeah, with the racial stuff and uh, more rights for women. Yeah, and, and they all, I mean, Laura Bush in her own way, they, they all, but uh, I, I will stick to those, uh, those ladies. Uh, Jeanette would like to know which first lady would have made a good president? Uh, <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt probably, although she didn't have a college education. Intellectually, I don't, I'm not saying you have to be a college grad to be an intellectual. I don't know about her intellectual, she was not stupid or anything. She was the most accomplished in a way. I think Hillary Clinton, honestly, would have been a good president had she beaten uh, Trump in, in 2016. Michelle Obama, uh, I don't think there's any 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 question. Uh, would Who knows, someday she may. They wanted her to run for vice president. Certainly, I think she, uh, she might qualify. And, and in her own homespun way, uh, Betty Ford, I, I think, wouldn't have taken any prisoners, and she would have been a very outward, blunt, honest first lady. 
or a president had she run, certainly had the popularity. But certainly, I guess, uh, when you cut it down, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, Hillary Clinton, and maybe Michelle Obama. Okay. Uh, we're going to have just a time for a couple more. So if anyone has one last question they want to get in, please type that in now. Um, uh, Linda asks, didn't Jane Wyman and Ronald Reagan adopt two children, their daughter, as mentioned, and son, Michael Reagan? I thought they adopted one. They had a daughter, and I thought they adopted one son. And they may have had one child that died in infancy. They may have had one child that died while he was, while they were considering their divorce in 1947-48. But they had one child that lived, that's Maureen, and they had one, they adopted a son, Michael, who's still, I guess they're both still alive. And they might have had a child, they did have one now, I think of it, they did have a child that was, uh, only lived a day or two. Okay. And then he had two more children by Nancy Davis. Ron and Patty. By Nancy Davis, two more. Yes. Okay. Right. Uh, so a quick clarification. Ronnie, Someone... who's still on TV, he was on Good Morning America, right, for many years. And uh, he was a dancer and stuff like that. Okay. And Patty, oh. yes, who I guess was the one in Playboy and kind of <laughs> terrorized the family for a while. But yeah, two and one by and one adopted child by Jane Wyman. All right. Um, and if one there's reincarnation and you meet Nancy Reagan, very nice woman, uh, personable to most people, but don't ever mention Jane Wyman or you'll be ostracized. Uh, someone pointed out that they think the Obamas actually didn't meet at Yale, but they met while working at the same law firm. Oh, that's right. That's right. She was a few years under. That is correct. That is correct. They both went to Yale Law School, but they met in a law office in Chicago, correct. I don't know if she was interning while she was at law school and he was a recent graduate. That's correct, I stand corrected. But All they right. both went to Yale Law. So I think this is gonna be our, our final question. Uh, going back to the some of the founding fathers, it's a question on, uh, Ronald says he's read First Family by Joseph J. Ellis. Is it true that Abigail wrote Abigail wrote many letters to John Adams, often at times giving him advice, and that those are available still well, in public records. Yes, Abigail uh, wrote a lot of letters to him. Uh, remember, there was no internet then, no telephones. Uh, she wrote many letters that still exist, and she that's where I got those quotes about take care of the women and we'll foment a rebellion if... Uh, if you don't, yes, they, they constantly wrote letters. She also wrote many, many letters to Thomas Jefferson. When Adams and Jefferson had a falling out, it was Abigail that brought him back together by writing letters to Jefferson. She was our most prolific first lady letter writer. And the same held true of John Quincy Adams' uh, wife, who not only verbally, but by letters advised him. But Abigail, there's another woman, that, you know, back then no woman was gonna run for anything, but she might've been a, a pretty decent president. Certainly had her uh, political beliefs and firm ones. All right, well, uh, we wanna thank everyone for joining us for this. Oh, tournament. one more first lady might've made a great president, yeah. although she was not that active politically, Lou Hoover. Absolutely, intellectually, she was right up there with any Lou Hoover. All right, well, uh, Again, thank you. And I'll give you the last word, Dr. Gudalunas. We want to say thank you again. Thank you to our funder, Roberta Peters-Jones. Remind everybody that these, are, uh, these lectures are available on our YouTube channel. So if you missed Tuesday, Wednesday, um, or part of today, you can go to our YouTube channel and find those. Today's will be up in its streaming yeah, live Yeah, the first right two now. are already up, I think. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, well, I want to thank you, TJ, and Steve and all that helped me, and I'm sorry I'm not politically, or I'm not uh, intellectual, no, technologically advanced, and I want to thank everybody out there, miss you a lot, and let's all hope, and if you pray, pray that we can meet next year, and I'll really count on, if, if, the, if the auditorium is not full next January, I'll be very, very upset. I know you're thinking what kind of man in his 70s worried about the size of crowds, but I know at least two in the country, I'm one of them, huh? Okay, so please, uh, I hope to see you next year. Oh, and one last thing, yes. If you think of anything that you want me to talk about next year, assuming I, I'll be back, 
uh, let TJ know. Uh, uh, somebody brought up a, uh, maybe talking about Henry Clay. There's some other stuff. I was thinking about the War of 1812, maybe. But if you think of anything, uh, let TJ know, and it'll give me some time to kick it around. So thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, everybody. Have a great day, and we'll see you soon for another program. Thank you.